Sounds good. Yeah, sure. All right. Awesome. So, all right. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to our second day of workshops at R and Pharma. And I'm very excited to uh, introduce uh, to two of our speakers for the Tidy uh, Transcriptomics workshop today. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to introduce Maria Doyle to you. Maria is the Application and Training Specialist for Research Computing at the Peter McCollum Cancer, uh, Cancer Center in Melbourne, Australia. She's a specialist in complex biological data who teaches researchers how to analyze their data sets. She has a PhD in molecular biology and expertise in bioinformatics and data science education and training. She is passionate about supporting researchers, reproducible research, open source R, uh, and uh, tidy data. And our second instructor for today is Stefana Mangiella. Stefana is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the WEHI Institute. His research focuses on tumor microenvironment and spans the areas of computational biology, statistics, and cell biology. His research is mainly focused on investigating the cellular and molecular interactions between cancer and benign cells in melanoma, prostate, and breast cancer. He has published several algorithms for applied Bayesian inference and transcriptomic data analysis. So welcome both of you and uh, myself is Volia Chaipiuti and I'm a statistician at Johnson & Johnson and um, I'm a part of our Informa organizing committee and I'll be your host for today. So uh, Marie and Stefano are welcome and why don't you take it away from here? Okay, sure. thanks Walha. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, so I'll get started and then I'll te be teaching the first half of the workshop and then Stefano will be teaching the second half. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, okay, can you all see my screen? Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to spend the first few minutes just giving you a little bit of an introduction to the workshop and what we're going to be talking about and a little bit of background. And I will post so we've actually made a website on GitHub that contains the material you'll see today and also what I'm going to speak about now. So I will put the link to that um, in the chat if I can. Um, where is the chat? Okay. Um, I tell you what, uh, it's right down at the bottom if, uh, oh. if you can see it. Yep. And it's got it. It's kind of, got it. Okay. Okay. Cool. cool. So I'll just pop that in there so if anybody wants to follow along with that on a separate screen they can. Okay great. Um, okay so welcome to the Tidy Transcriptomics Workshop. Um, what we are going to, so, so I'm actually going to start with this background tab here. So this is um, the schedule for today. We've got it split into three parts. Um, the first part is going to be on bulk RNA sequencing core um, analysis for that type of data. And the second part will be on some more details around um, bulk, bulk RNA-seq analysis. And the final, the third part, we will um, look at a bit of single cell RNA-seq data. And we've got a more detailed schedule that you can find at that link if you want to see. So this is a rough guide of what we're aiming for with time and format. So we've got some hands-on dem demos where I'll be um, going through an R Markdown document in R Studio Cloud, and you can follow along with me as well with running code. And we've got some short exercises um, during that material. And we'll also have some Q&A, and we've got some breaks scheduled in as well. And we'll have some additional time for Q&A at the end if you want to hang around for that. Okay, so I'll go back to the background here. And so, yeah, so the format is just this few little introductionary uh, background, then the demos, exercises, and the Q&A, and how we'll interact or how you can interact with us is you can put any questions you have in the, in the Zoom chat. And we'll also have a few polls that we hope you'll take part in. Okay, so we know from the um, registration questions that some of you are new to transcriptomics, so we're just gonna explain a little bit um, of what it is. So transcriptomics, is studying the RNA transcripts in a cell. So 
the um, transcriptome is how the DNA in the genome can get translated into proteins, so into the proteome. But the transcripts, they can be protein coding transcripts or they can be non-coding transcripts as well. And why would you study transcriptomics? So especially in the context of drug, dis drug discovery, um, it can be useful to use transcriptomics as a way to measure the effects of drugs because the genome tends to be more stable, the proteome is harder to measure, and the trans with the transcriptome, you can actually measure changes in thousands of genes and both coding, protein coding, and also non-coding transcripts. And this is just an example of a recent publication that is using transcriptome profiling in drug discovery. And here we see a possible experimental design that you might use in your area. So you might have some samples treated with a drug. You might want to know the effect of that drug. So you can use extract the transcriptome from those samples. And then what you would typically do then is compare that to a set of um, untreated samples and see what transcripts are different between the two groups. And we'll be seeing some of that in the hands-on part of the workshop. And so how does transcriptomics actually work? So what you do in the lab is you extract the transcripts from your samples and then you fragment them into what we call a sequence library. And then that goes on the sequencer uh, machine. And from that, then we get our raw data, which is these short sequence reads. And they are typically from about 50 to 150 bases. And once you've got that transcriptomic data, there's different types of analyses you can do. And the most common type is differential expression. And that's the main focus of today's workshop, showing you how that analysis can be done in R. And we're also gonna show you a bit on how you can analyze cell types within um, an RNA-seq analysis. So for example, you can identify what immune cell populations are present in your sample and whether they're changing and then there's other types of analysis you can do. And then here then, we this is a pretty typical RNA sequencing analysis workflow for differential expression. Um, so what we get, what we start with is our raw reads. We map them to a reference genome, for example, the human reference genome. And then we count how many reads we have for our genes. And it's these counts that we're going to be starting with today in this workshop. And we're going to be doing some exploring of that data, doing some quality checks of the data, and doing some testing then of differential expression, seeing which transcripts are changed in our groups. And we're going to be using a new package called TidyBulk, which is a package Stefano has written, who's co-presenting here today. And we'll see how that package allows you to do RNA sequencing analysis using tidyverse style analysis. So it's really nice. And then in part three, Stefano will be um, introducing you to single cell RNA sequencing analysis. So he'll come back to this and um, these two slides here. And so at this point, we would like you to get started with the RNA RStudio Cloud. So we've got the material set up in our studio cloud and that is only available during the workshop and the, as the resources have kindly been provided by the R Pharma organization so they've gotten this um, enough resources to for you all to be able to run the material in a hands-on way but before I switch over to doing that I'll just mention that we if you want to run this material on your own computer you can do that after the workshop and you can find the instructions in how to install everything, including the exact version we're using through this link here. But we do recommend you use the cloud because everything is set up and ready to go. Okay, so hopefully you all got the invite to join the R Pharma um, classroom to enjoy, join the workspace. And if you can head over to their, head to the R Studio cloud now, and log in, I'm sorry, that's a bit small, but you should see there's an R Pharma 
Toddy Transcriptomics Project, and there's a looking like this, and there's a start button. So what we want you to do is to click on that start to launch um, our project in the cloud and open up this Tidy Transcriptomics Markdown file that's in the vignettes folder in that project. So I am going to move over to that now. I've already got mine launched, but I will give you I'll give you um, a minute or two to get set up there. Kicking off the uh, project for some new participants may take a minute, just a okay, yeah. quick note. Um, it, it usually doesn't take that long, but sometimes it can. Um, just So if, if you're sitting there and it takes a minute or two, uh, no worries. Um, but if it goes on for you know three or four or five minutes, then just refresh the page. But uh, we only had that happen once yesterday, so. Okay, and if anybody can't find the link or doesn't know how to get here, maybe let us know in the chat. We'll see if we can help you. Yep, I just uh, put my contact in the uh, chat box. If anybody has any issues and want to message me privately, feel you're more than welcome to. Um, everybody on the workshop should have got an invite uh, yesterday via email with the uh, the link right to the the classroom. Um, so if they they click on that link, it should open, take them right to it. And then um, if for some reason um, you didn't get the invite, yeah, I've got a few people letting me know, so I will. Uh, okay. I will, okay. Yep, I'll send them uh, to these people directly. So. Thanks, Phil. Yep, and all I need is the, uh, when you message me, just give me your email address, and then I'm gonna go in at, to our CEO Cloud as the administrator and send you the invite. Um, it usually goes to your inbox. I didn't have anybody yesterday out of, you know, 160 people or so that didn't, that it um, went to their spam. So uh, if, if you don't see it, let me know. Um, but for the most part, it should show up in your inbox. Okay. And I'll just show people that if they do log in, manage to log in, oops, you might initially see in your files pane uh, a whole lot of files because we created this as an R package. So there's some extra files there, but you don't need to worry about those. We want you to go into the vignettes folder and open up this R markdown document called Tidy Transcriptomics. So if you click on that, this is where we're hoping that you end up. Um, and while we're giving people a minute or two to get set up, I might just go back to the website here. So the web link that we put in the chat to say, we are gonna be showing you and walking you through the R Markdown document, but there's a rendered version available through that website, which will be available after the workshop as well. So we're, we're planning on leaving that um, permanently there. So you can see what the R Markdown looks like. Um, as well. Um, okay. Okay, there's a few people looking to get the link to the cloud. So while everyone is, is getting ramped up, I'm curious, uh, this is Brian Downey at Gilead Sciences. Um, I'm curious uh, which kind of uh, differential gene expression analysis workflows the 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 type of transcriptomics supports. By which type do you mean uh, which packages? You know, which edge R, Voomlima, DSeq2. All of them. That's what you're going to uh, see. Right. So um, it's actually, a new, so originally Stefano, I don't know if he wants to comment more, he initially set it up using Edge R, but in the last couple of months, he's added in Limavoom and DC2, and you're actually the first group of people, I think, to see it in action. Is that right, Stefano? Uh, yeah, that's right. The idea is to make uh, abstract the analysis uh, in a way it's easy to integrate and check different algorithms yeah and free bernie do you have experience then using the different packages 
Uh, yeah, I've I've used um, all of them to to varying degrees. Um, the uh, um, I, I'm so I, I don't know if I don't want to derail the the uh, the the workshop. Um, but I'm also curious whether or not um, there's support for random effects um, as well in the uh, in the package. Yeah, I, unless I'm missing something, I'm pretty sure the answer is no at this stage. Okay, but it, um, is it on the plan? Yes, but as we will repeat a lot in this workshop, uh, we are really happy on our GitHub uh, repository to accept suggestions, critiques, contribution, and so on. So that's the right place to remind us what okay. yeah. we like to see. Make, that makes perfect sense. Okay, I've had about four or five people that have messaged me, and I've I've sent most of you the uh, the invite. Or if um, or if I haven't sent the invite to you, it's because you already got the invite. So just take a look. You probably would have got it last night around 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It will just say our studio cloud invitation, um, and maybe just check that spam folder um, in case it went there. But for the most part, I think all of you should have got the invite just now. Or um, or you already uh, got the invite last night for the RCU cloud uh, environment. All right, and um, there's a few people saying they, they can't find it. Just maybe give me a second email if that's okay, and we'll try sending it to a second email address. Um, but uh, what I need on my end is for you to just send me an email address, and then I can use that. Okay. All right, but I, I'm guessing of the... Um, of the majority of the 60 or so that's on, uh, probably 90% of them should be good to go, so. Okay, so right. we'll, get, we'll get leaving, okay. Okay, great, um, I'm just gonna mention here that I, actually I found this out recently, thanks to Stefano, you, there's a little sidebar that you can use in the R Markdown document, you can see what I'm clicking on now, a little icon, but you might find that helpful for during this workshop, you can see which section we're at. So I will leave that open and you can feel free to have that open in your version as well. Okay, great. So this is our tidy transcriptomics workshop, our markdown. And so what you're gonna to see today is RNA sequencing analysis being performed according to the tidy data paradigm. And we like the tidy data paradigm because it provides a standard way to organize data. So if any of you have experience with using R packages, such as Edge R or DC2, um, you may have seen that they have their own objects. So it's um, not tidyverse um, and tidy bulk. The package we're gonna see today sticks with the tidy data um, format where we've got every variable is in its own column and every observation is in its own row and the data structure stays consistent across the different functions that we'll use. And also the tidy bulk package we're gonna use today, it provides an easier to understand vocabulary than, some, than the existing R, RNA-seq packages for the steps in the workflow. Um, and we'll also see a tidy heat map package which Stefano has created as well for doing creating heat maps um, which we like to do with biological data. We can do that in a tidy way now, thanks to his nice package. Okay, so we were just for a little warm up, gonna start with a poll um, to find out who here is, or how many of you, I should say, it's anonymous, um, are gonna code along with us. So run the code chunks we've got, and also try out some of the small exercises that we've got during the workshop. Um, so, Fall, fall have you can launch the poll or can I launch it? Okay, great. So if you could um, answer the questions, that would be great, just to give us an idea of how many people are here and interested in coding. 
Okay, that's great. We can see you're filling them out. Brilliant. And also, yeah, do you have experience with transcriptomic analysis? Um, bulk or single cell or, or both? And do you have experience with tidyverse? Okay, give you another few seconds to fill it out. Um, A really good crowd today. Yeah, it's definitely, yes. Can you see the poll as well? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, okay. So just because Stefano's co host, I guess you can see it. But it's nice. We can see that you're at least engaged with the poll. <laughs> okay, so 85% of you have voted. That's pretty good. And I guess we won't hit 100 because myself and Stefano and the hosts are probably not going <laughs> to. Yeah, I think. Uh... We have a uh, clear idea on, on the proportions here. Yeah, okay, so we see most of you, 75% of you are going to try. Um, can I share the results? I'm uh, trying to share the results. So if you want to see, thanks for voting. Um, yeah, 75% of you are going to code along with us. 25% aren't, that's fine. We assume some people just want to watch, listen. Okay, just over the half have experience, have no experience with transcriptomic analysis. That's fine. Some with bulk, a little bit with single cell, and a little bit with both. Okay. And do you have experience with tidyverse? Oh, we've got some quite experienced tidyverse people here. Half of you have a lot, and half of you have a little. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, I'm going to stop sharing that poll now. Thanks, Walha, for that. Okay. I'll continue on. Okay, so RNA sequencing has been around for about 10 years or so now, and it's a really popular method for analyzing the effects of, for example, drugs, as I said, because it gives you this ability to measure thousands instead of just one or two um, of, of genes and their expression. And as I already mentioned, there's many steps involved, but in this workshop, we're going to start with from the counts, which is typically what we start with in R, usually the upstream steps we do with the uh, HPC high performance um, computer. Okay, so this is, I'm going to load in. And um, the libraries we're going to use. So I'm going to be running these chunks and then explaining what's happening and feel free to also run them along so you can check that you're getting the same, you should be getting the same results that I'm getting. Okay, so the packages we're using, we're using a data set called Airway, which I'll explain. We've got Tidyverse packages that some of you will be familiar with, and then Tidybulk and Tidyheatmap. Um, we will see in action. Okay, so this next chunk is setting up the colors we're gonna use in the plots. So it's not essential to do this. This is just us setting up a custom theme that we like, so say getting rid of the standard uh, the GG plot gray right background, so just making it a bit look a bit nicer. Okay, so the first data set we're going to work with today is called Airway, and it's from a published paper um, uh, referenced here. And there's eight samples in it, and they're from human uh, smooth muscle cells, and they're actually looking for an asthma treatment. And they have samples from four cell lines. And for each cell line, they have one sample which they treated with dexamethasone. And they have an untreated negative control sample as well. And so seq RNA sequencing is performed on this. And the data is lo we loaded in as a bioconductor object. And the first thing we're going to do is convert it into a tidy bulk table. So table is the tidyverse uh, table format. And a tidy bulk table just adds on some information for tidy bulk to use for the RNA seq functions. And we'll be using the tidyverse pipe a lot in this workshop. And for the, some of you who aren't that familiar with tidyverse, just to explain it. So, what there's an example of it in use here. What it does is it pipes the output from the command on the left into the command on the right. And it's not essential to use, but it helps to reduce the amount of code that we um, write, and it can make steps easier to see. Okay, so this first chunk, 
is we're loading the data from the airway package. We're loading in those eight samples. We're converting it into the tidy bulk table. And then we'll have a look and just see what that looks like. Okay, so this is RNA sequencing count data in tidy form. So these are our gene IDs. They're called, they're of type ensemble. These are our sample IDs. And then we've also got the counts for each of these genes in each of our samples. Um, okay, and the other columns you're gonna see us using here, we've got a column called cell, which contains which of the four cell lines um, the sample is from. And also we've got our dex column and that says which are the treated samples and which are the untreated. Okay. So does does so first um, things with sorry, uh, does is there is there a requirement that you need to have the data in a range summarized experiment before importing it into tidy transcriptomics? Uh, no, absolutely not. We did that just for convenience here, okay. and we have um, if you can see where I'm pointing at the sidebar supplementary. There's a section there showing you how to if you're starting from tables like regular. Excel CSV files, how you can manipulate that. Great, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah just to add, um, it's possible to uh, create uh, tidy bulk tables from tables or summarize experiments or even from BAM files uh, directly. So with, uh, with few annotations added to them. Okay. Okay, so the next couple of steps are formatting the data a bit. So I'm here, I'm removing the prefix of the sample IDs, and this is just for convenience, because all eight sample IDs have this big long prefix, which gets a bit um, annoying in the plots. So I'm stripping that off and just keeping the unique sample identifier. So that's what that step is doing, and it's using tidy versus mutate to add a, um, add a column. So the sample column is now gonna have this, the samples with the strict prefix. Okay, and, and the next thing we're gonna do is get gene symbols, because I showed you we have gene IDs, so they're the ensemble IDs, which are not that human intuitive as to which genus they are from. So what this um, command is doing here is it's adding a column called symbol, and it's using a bioconductor package um, and I forgot to mention, so Bioconductor is a repository, if you don't know what it is, it's a repository of um, a few thousand R packages for analysis of biological data. So, and this is one of the annotation packages they provide for annotating human um, data. And so what this is doing is it's taking our ensemble gene IDs and it's getting us um, the symbols for them. And then this bit is saying, because some of the genes have multiple symbols, just give us the first one, which is a typical thing to do. So now we should see, if you run that command, that we've got a column added at the end with the gene symbols. Okay. And this block here is showing that I didn't have to create those intermediary variables. I did that just for education purposes to show you what each step was doing. We could combine all those steps using the pipe. And in that case, we would have less temporary variables, uh, so less chance of introducing errors um, and less typing, and we can see what steps we're doing um, here. Okay, so that bit was just setting up the data and formatting. So now we're actually gonna do um, some RNA sequencing analysis specific steps. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna remove genes that don't, that are lowly transcribed, lowly expressed. They don't have enough counts for us to be interested in them because they're not giving us enough evidence that we can use in statistical testing. If we kept them in, they can also interfere with some of the statistical um, approximations that are being used. And they can also add to the multiple testing, um, which I'll explain in a bit um, when we're estimating false discovery rates. So they reduce our ability to detect differentially expressed genes. So we typically filter them. And we can do this using the tidy bulk. Tidy bulk has a function called keep abundant. And we filter out the genes by saying, 
what is our column that contains our groups. So in this case, it's the DEX column that has whether they're treated or untreated. And that will identify and filter out the genes that don't have adequate abundance for the testing. And so we should see by running that function that we get a column called dot abundant added, and that's going to have true for um, every uh, gene. Because Tidybook also provides uh, another function called identify abundant that would keep all our input and flag true or false for whether it was abundant or not if you wanted to retain all the information. Okay, so after removing genes with low expression, what we do next then is we normalize um, our counts or we, we scale our counts. And we're doing, we do this to, it's another standard um, step in RNA sequencing analysis. And we do it to remove differences between the samples that are not interesting. They are not um, part of the treated versus untreated biological effect that we're interested in. And these differences can come from sequencing depth, so we can have different numbers of reads for each sample uh, or composition between the samples, and you can get a more detailed explanation of those um, at that link I put there. And TidyBulk has a convenient function called scale abundance, which will do this scaling of the counts for us. So if I run that there. Um, I see a question popping up in the chat. Is there a default abundance threshold? I'll answer that as I go here. So this is by giving it the groups here, it's using um, an edge R. So one of the R packages that we mentioned earlier that has a, build, a function called filter by expression. It uses the number of groups here to decide it's going to keep transcripts that have at least 10 counts in a minimum number of samples the minimum number being the smallest group size. So in our case, we've got four treated samples, four untreated. So it's going to keep genes if they have at least 10 counts across four samples. Okay. Okay, so after the filtering and then the scaling. So when we run the scale abundance command, we should see we've got some columns added at the end. And this is the key one here. So it's now got our scaled counts. And we can have a look, the nice, a nice feature about Tidy Bulk is the outputs all fit nicely with um, ggplot so we can, and Tidyverse, so we can easily manipulate the data and plot it. So what we're going to do here is another thing we typically do is we look at the distributions of the counts in the samples. We want to see, do they look similar or is there any that look um, odd, any samples that look odd distribution. So here we're taking the scale counts. We're going to use Tidyverse pivot longer. We're going to use it to create a column to reshape the data to create a column called source that is going to contain both the counts and the scale counts, so the raw counts and the scale counts, and label which they're from. And then we can create a density. Oh, so I forgot to run the theme at the top. Hang on. So here we're setting up the plotting. Um, okay, I forgot to actually run the team. Okay, so I'll go back down to the density plot. Okay, here. So it's going to make a density plot for each of the samples, and we'll also we can use the ggplot facet wrap to easily create multiple plots with tidybook, which is brilliant. Okay, so here we've got a uh, two density plots of the one of the raw counts and one of the scale counts. And so we can see the distributions are more similar after the scaling. And none of our samples look particularly odd with odd distributions. So that looks fine. Okay, and to mention here that this is shown comparison of tidy bulk versus the typical base R method of analyzing data. So in this case, using edge R. So the point here is to say that we, thanks to tidybook, we can write a lot less code to create density plots like that compared to if we were gonna do base R and say edge R, we would have to write a lot more code 
to create similar plots and more chance for errors. Okay. And now we're going to do some exploratory analysis, creating a principal component plot. So you can create both PCA or um, MDS plots with TidyBook. And this is a really important plot that we always make with an RNA-seq analysis um, because we want to see how do our samples look, are our replicates um, grouping together, do we have any outliers, uh, do we have any sample swaps. So it's a really important plot to make. And with TidyBook, it provides a function called reduce dimensions. And you can give it the scale counts and it will plot, or sorry, it will generate the principal components um, for PCA. So in this case, it defaults to the first two principal components. And, oh yeah, I have a little mini poll to go here, just as a, as a small pause. So Vala, can you, can you launch the next poll, please? Thank you, come in. Um, thank you. Okay, so the question is, and it's just a small question. What fraction of variance is explained by PC3? Okay, is it 35, 18, or 16? And so at the moment I showed you that the default is PC1 and 2. So the hint is that if you look at the help of reduced dimensions, you can get more than two. You're not limited to just two dimensions. Okay. I'll give you give you a, a moment to vote. I'll take a drink of water. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mentioned, uh, Maria, you mentioned that uh, they can um, do a uh, type question mark and function name to, to see the other optional arguments that, that this function takes. I did not mention that. Did I? I, I put in the in the hint here. Oops. I see. But I did not actually mention it, thanks, yeah. So yeah, you can do question mark, reduce dimensions to see how to get it. So once, once you read the documentation uh, using the question mark, it's pretty straightforward to understand how to uh, answer the question. Okay, is that everyone who wants to vote? Okay, give you a few more seconds. Where did the poll go to vote? Oh, can you can you see it now? It's a pop up window. Usually, it pops up uh, in the uh, you know in front of you, but maybe you have to fish for it. There, there, there might be a poll uh, button in the bottom menu that you can click. Okay. And I will get ready to show in the. Okay, 70% of people have voted. I think that's fine. Okay, so the winner is at 16. Yeah, so what fraction of variance is 16? And 39% of you got that. Yes, that is right and i'll show you how you can get it so i'm using the console so there's a dot dims and you can specify how many dimensions you want so the default is two so we can say we want three oops and it will tell us then that our pc3 principal component three has 16 percent variance so great well done uh, yes well done uh, okay i will are you seeing the my poll results or? I click share results so everybody. Oh, okay, can... okay, thanks. Yeah. Just as curiosity. Okay. Will I stop sharing that now? Sure, yeah. Okay. Okay. And I will continue on. So let's have a look at what um, the principal components look like joined to the counts object. So having a look, oops. So we should see that we have some columns added at the end for PC1 and PC2. 
And what we can do then is, so that's joined it to our original data. So we've got um, a table of over 100,000 rows. But for plotting, we really just want the, the information for the sample. So tidybook provides a way to extract the sample specific columns. So it's called pivot sample. So in that case, now we, ju we get just eight rows. So one row for each sample that has the PC1 and PC2 information, rather than one row with every transcript for every sample, which is why the previous table is large. Okay, and then we can use that then to create a PCA plot. So we'll create a, uh, use ggplot to make a scatter plot. Um, and what we're gonna do is plot PC1 and PC2. We're gonna take advantage of the fact that um, with ggplot, we can specify the column, a column to use to color it. So we're gonna color it by treatment. We're gonna use shape for the cell lines so we can see which of the four cell lines are here. We're using geon text repel from the uh, GG, GG uh, repel Ma package. Maria, mm -hmm. uh, there is someone yes. Uh, with some error regarding um, SC2 uh, DG list uh, for the IRA package. Um, oh, I don't remember exactly what this function does. Let me see. I should remember. Ah, okay. Summarize experiment to DG list. Uh, yes, uh, this function is from what package? A jar. Uh, can you uh, the people? Yeah, exactly. I was saying that. Yeah, you need load editor. Yeah, actually, so I did have this comment here that says example code, no need to run. But of course, if you do want to run it, then you will know, need to load in the EdgeR library because we did have EdgeR library load in a previous version of this workshop. So that's uh, good to know. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Thanks, okay. uh, Lick. Yeah, thanks. Edge library EdgeR. I, I will explicitly write here for maybe the people that experience with this yeah okay thanks for helping answer that one um okay so back to the pca plot we're coloring by whether they're treated or untreated we're using shapes for which cell line they're from oh yeah and repel then so we can add which uh, the sample label and not have the sample label squashed on top of the point so that's why um that repel is handy for for doing that, repelling labels. And so what we can see here is, this is quite a nice result in that PC1, the greatest source of variation is separating our samples into our treated and our untreated group. So that's what we're hoping to see. The greatest effect is from the, the depth treatment. PC2 then is separating this cell line here. So the cell line that's a square, is separating from the other samples. So that's this cell line here. So that's telling us that that cell line is a bit different to the others. Okay, so- Do you have any way of uh, pulling out the uh, percent variance and sticking it conveniently there in the axis, or is that not part of the current release? Well, yeah, I thought about that uh, several times. The only problem is that the column, since all this comes uh, for free in a way because the column names are already the thing you plot. Uh, for doing that, naturally, uh, we should alter the column names with a percentage and would not, they would not be a constant, you know, they would not be consistent in between analysis. And so there is this cost. And um, for allowing to do it, you know, uh, we should build a, a heavier machinery uh, behind that. So, at the moment, um, we decided that it's not worth it, but is a nice point that I, I thought many times. Mm -hmm. um, and then a complementary plot we can make to piece uh, principal component plots is a um, heat map of variable genes. So we can see our, our use it to do a hierarchical clustering of our samples to see, um, again, the relationship between them what samples cluster together and do we have outliers so tidy bulk provides this handy keep variable function because we don't want to plot all whatever we've got at the moment um 20 000 genes so we're selecting the 500 most variable here and we're piping that into this heat map function from tidy heat map 
which takes data in tidy format. So I will run that here. And tidy heat map allow, allows you to specify what annotations you want to add. So we can add our dex um, information and we can add um, the cell line information as well. So then we get a heat map like this. So we've got our eight samples, the 500 most variable genes. We can see which cell line they're from and which uh, treatment they had. And so similar with the PCA plot, we can see our treated and our untreated samples grouped together. But we do have one cell line that again, is a or same cell line is a bit different to the others. And for comparison, again, to say that we can do what we've just done there with the heat map with less code and less temporary variables than if we were going to do it using base R using a package like a jar directly. Okay, so that's having a um, some, doing some quality checks and visualization of the data. Now we're going on to move on to the actual testing. So we are going to use, I'll run this here. So we are going to use the test differential abundance function from tidy bulk. We are going to use a formula. So this would be similar to what we do with a package like Edge R and we specify um, what we want to test. So here I'm saying we want to test the uh, DEX column, so the treated versus untreated. And we're also adding cell line as an additional factor because we know um, that's contributing some variation as we can see it in the plots. And then we can specify what contrast we're interested in. So what comparison do we want to make? So we want to make, so from the DEX column, we want to compare the treated column to the untreated column. And then this little bit is just saying, don't put this um, contrast in the column names because we want to make some plots in, the, um, in a minute and it kind of it just gets in the way. Okay. Um, so just some messaging from Edgar or from, from Tidybook, so that's fine. And then we'll have a look at our output. So this will be, excuse me, this is our original table with now we've got some more columns at the end. So we've got our log fold change telling us um, whether the genes are up, increased or decreased in the treated samples compared to the untreated sample. We've also got our p-value, our measure of significance, and our FGR false discovery rate. Uh, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a second. And like before that we saw with the pivot sample, that we can pivot sample function, we can use that to reduce our input table with the information added on to just the sample specific information. Here we can reduce our uh, table to just the transcript specific information. So removing the sample, um, if I show here, rather than having the every one row for every transcript and every sample, we can just have the, the transcript. So a table of 15,000 rows instead. So this would be equivalent to a diff if any of you have worked with differentially expressed um, results, the table that you might send the biologist to, to look at in Excel. Okay. And if you're not familiar with um, this type of analysis, so when I'm saying log fold change here, it's log to treated and compared to untreated. Um, okay, and to, again, for another comparison, if we were to do it without tidy book, if we were gonna do it with standard edge R, this would be a typical way we would do that. And again, notice a lot more temporary variables need to be created and also more cryptic um, cryptic function names um, rather than test differential expression scale abundance, which is um, the easy to use vocabulary that Tidybook provides. Um, Maria, there is a, yeah. a question for you. Uh, there is another question I was typing, but um, I actually will, will uh, reply um, to this. Uh, so uh, do you do the PCA on the a scale data, scale abundance, or the raw counts. So as happens for other objects, such as uh, summarized experiments and so on, if, uh, if 
you have a scaled abundance calculated, that becomes the default uh, for many procedures except hypothesis testing and the, as the messages you have seen before states. Having said that, there is a default, but you can also, you, for each function, you can always specify sample transcript and abundance column. If you specify those, that would override anything. So, um, so that's all, always a possibility to force wh whatever calculation on whatever uh, abundance um, you want. And then for uh, Maria, there is, uh, could you please comment on the formula syntax? Because, yes, uh, and actually but, just to add to that, I think that question might be actually asking, do you use, which is better to use, the, the normal, the scaled or the raw. So we typically do it on the scaled because we want to see the differences when we've taken into account those things, the uninteresting differences like differences in numbers of reads and between samples. Uh, okay, so the second question was, why the formula syntax? Why is there a zero? Okay, so that's because I'm using the contrast. So I'm specifying what contrast to use. You don't have to use the zero. So if you didn't, then you would get this intercept column and it's, you can't specify the contrast you want as easily. So it's because I wanna be very explicit here about what we're comparing. Um, Maria, one quick note is if you go to the RCU cloud logo and you hit the X, it will make it a little bit bigger. Just FYI. Oh. Yep. Right there to the left. Right, right to oh, the here. right. Yeah, there you go. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That doesn't help. laughs> okay. Thanks for the tip. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so yeah, we're compared to EdgeR. Okay, we've got our table. So this is showing that you can use a tidy versus white underscore TC if you want to create a file that you can load into Excel or that, it's easy to output the results. Okay, and now if we want to count how many differentially expressed genes we have, um, we usually, as you'll see, take a cutoff of a typical one is 0 0.05 using the FDR or the adjusted p-value column. And we don't use the raw p-value. And reason for this, in case you don't know, is because of multiple testing, because we are testing thousands of genes, many genes. Um, and so we need to factor in that um, we've increased our chance of finding significant results because we're doing so many tests. So we need to control the false discovery rate. So, and by using 0.05, we're saying that for example, if we had 100 genes, we will accept that five will be false positives. So just to explain, and so if we use that to decide how many differentially expressed genes there are, so we can filter our table for um, transcripts with FTR less than 0.05, and we can then use tidyverse's summarize function to find how many distinct genes we have. So we can see we have almost 5,000 differentially expressed genes um, and so, and now we're going to have another little poll, just as a chance to pause and to give you a chance to um, have a play with some of this code. So the question is, how many differentially expressed transcripts are there for FDR less than 0.05 if we didn't include cell line in the formula? So if I go back, oh. so here. So as I mentioned, we included cell line because we could see that there was variation um, due to that, due to the cell line um, in both PCA and heat map. But what if we had just blindly tried to analyze the data and hadn't um, accounted for that? How many differentially expressed genes would we get? Okay, so I'll give you just a chance to vote. Is it? Yeah. 5,000 still, or would we have closer to 3,000, or would we have closer to 2,000? Uh, I will show the results at the end, so I think it's nice for people to see uh, what the distribution is. Yeah, okay. thanks. So yeah, you can try out the code, or you can just guess. 
Hmm. But all right, uh, you can still Ooh, try size, but we end the poll and we show you the results. So the majority of you have voted for the third option. Yeah, and that's correct. So we would get a lot less genes if we um, had not accounted for the cell line. So this is an example of why it's important. If you know there's um, a source of variation, like if it's a batch effect that you can see included in your formula when you're doing the testing. Okay. Okay, so next bit, we are going to extract our top genes, so top genes by smallest p-value, because we're going to use these in a couple of the plots. So I'm on this. So what we're doing is we're taking, generating our table of different expressed genes, we're sorting by the p-value, and we're taking top six. So that's them here. And the next thing I'm going to do is pull out the symbols so we can use them as labels in the plot. So we can use a uh, tidy burst pull. And these are just examples of, again, of how tidy bulk outputs all just nicely fit in, in with the tidy burst um, standard way of analyzing data. OK, so here we get our six gene symbols. And a very common plot we make with RNA sequencing data is a volcano plot. So this is um, how we can visualize the results of an RNA sequencing experiment. So what this is showing here is, is it's plotting the log fall change on the x-axis. So this is telling us that, and each point here is um, a gene. So we can see that these ones on the right of the zero are incre have increased expression with this DEX treatment. And the ones on the left, to the left of the zero have decreased with the DEX treatment. And we can see, and it also tells us the genes near the top of the plot are more significant than the ones um, near the bottom. And a nice feature of tidy bulk, because typically you make a volcano plot plotting the negative log 10 p-value and you can't really interpret them so easily the actual p-value. But tidy bulk, you, tidy bulk uses a custom ggplot scale um, that does the log 10 reverse uh, scale for you. So you can still see what the actual p-value is. And then this is to show that that was quite a, a basic volcano plot. But you can use a lot of the typical ggplot and tidyverse ways of analyzing data to make a more informative plot. So you can select not just genes that are significant, uh, less than 0.05, you can select the ones that, are, that have the biggest effect sizes. So log full chains greater than two. Um, you can add labels. So we're going to use GG, uh, GG text repel to repel the gene labels so we can see them in the plot. Actually, I'll show you here. So this is what we're aiming for. Um, and we can use ggplot size um, to size the points by significance. We can use alpha, the transparency uh, with the significance as well. And again, using um, the, the scale so we can see the p-value and then color the points as we want. So yes, yeah, so, so use ggplot style to make a nice plot. Okay, and the last pot plotting in this section will be showing you then Another type of plot we can look at it, which is strip charts. So this is where we can look at the count values for the individual samples. So we can use this to see how much do we believe in the effect, the difference between the treated and the untreated groups if we visualize the counts for each of our samples. So for all our eight samples. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, um, so what we're doing here is we're taking our scale counts, we're filtering them for our top six genes, and I just picked top six as an example, pick whatever number you want, and we can color by our treatment, we can add a sample labels, 
and we will make a jittered box plot, GT plot. And then again, using the facet graph to easily make multiple plots for our six genes. And so that's what we get here. So now we've got them, each of our samples from whether it's in our treated or our untreated group. And we can have a look to see um, how the replicates compare and whether we think it's a good difference between them. Um, okay, and so that's looking at, what are we doing there? We're looking at the scale counts and you can quite easily look at both the raw and the scaled if you want to see um, how, they, how they compared. And again, we can use pivot longer to, like we did with the density plots, to reshape the data and um, generate a similar strip chart to above, but now we can see both counts and both raw counts and scale counts for our treated and our untreated groups if you want to have a closer look. Okay, and I see a question popped up in the chat about interactivity and yeah, and really nice um, feature of tidybulk integrating with ggplot. ggplot then integrates nicely with plotly for making interactive plots. So we can use ggplot plotly to make pretty much any of these plots then that we're making interactive. So a common one might be you want to look at those with those strip charts, you can't see which point belongs to which sample, make it interactive, and then you can actually hover over and see. So now this is an interactive version, so we can see which sample is, is which. Or as the question came up, you could also make an interactive volcano plot and hover over to see which, which thing, if you've got interesting points in the plot. Okay, and the final thing in this part one is uh, just- Maria, if we can yeah. uh, add something, uh, can you go up to the uh, to the faceted um, strip charts? Yeah. yeah. So, for who is used to base R, um, I would like to stress that doing this faceted plot and reshaping the data to create this uh, quite information dense plot where we see the difference for the row counts, for the scale counts, if we adjusted uh, for removing a wanted variation for the adjusted counts. So you, we are organizing all this data using some reshaping NGG plot quite easily. It would be pretty uh, intense coding and a lot of variable creation uh, with Bayesar. So, so all, all these uh, manipulation, they seem quite natural um, with Tidyverse, but they used to be uh, quite tedious. So uh, that's something that's enabled uh, automatically when you interface with Tidyverse and you organize the information in a tidy way. Thanks, Stefano. Um, and last thing to point out in this part uh, is that Tidybook has a handy function if you want to get what um, the references for the methods it's using. So as I mentioned, it's using as default the edge R analysis algorithm for the testing. So by running get bibliography on your object, um, you can get the references in bibtex format for each of the papers used, and then you could load that into your reference manager or have it there conveniently for when you want to write up what you did. Okay, so the, that's the end of part one. So just to recap, that um, you've hopefully seen now that you can analyze RNA sequencing data in a tidy way using Tidybulk and can see how it integrates with Tidyverse. Um, we've seen, we've used piping a lot to show that you don't need to create um, all these intermediary variables. So that can help you write less code and potentially less um, errors. And the tidy bulk enables you to do an RNA analysis that integrates, and like Stefano mentioned there, really nicely with Tidyverse's um, convenient short ways of manipulating data and plotting it. And we've seen some of the key steps in an RNA sequencing analysis, uh, things such as filtering transcripts that don't have um, adequate expression adjusting scaling counts 
uh, for the differences that we're not interested in and testing for um, differential expression. And we've seen PCA plots and how we can use them to check the data and also some other types of plots. And so this is a link to supplementary information which has some other things that we don't have time to include here such as if you're starting from tables. And now at this point we have a, a, have a pause. So we've got a few little exercises here using a different data set to see if you can apply some of what we've shown to another data set. So this data set is called Priscilla. It's a Drosophila experiment and it's got seven samples, uh, three treated and four untreated controls. And the treatment information this time is in a column called condition. And an additional factor is that some of the samples have been sequenced with paired end sequencing and some with single end sequencing. Um, and so this is how to set up the data. So like what we did with the airway human data set. So it's uh, creating the tidy book table and then it's adding gene symbols. And in this case, it's from Drosophila. So this is, this is how you would do it for another species. Um, and then we've got three poll questions here for, can you tell us what the PC1 is? Um, can you tell us how many differentially expressed genes there are? And can you tell us what the 10th, 10th most differentially expressed gene is by smallest p-value? Just to get you um, a chance to try some of these tidy bulk functions on another data set. Um, so we're going to pause there and also see if you've got any more questions you want us to answer. And we will... Um, give you, I'm just thinking 12. Can we? Can we launch the next poll now, Walha, and have it? Sure. So we can use that as a way to gauge if people have gotten through those first three questions. Um, and yeah, myself and Stefano will answer any other questions you have. And once, yeah, once we've given a chance for a few of these, I think, to answer. We were going to give 10 minutes at this point, Stefano, but we're already 10 minutes beyond, oh, sorry, 20 minutes beyond where we were going to be. Um, um, yes, uh, yeah, we can give a few minutes to, for people to enter in the thinking bubble of another data set. But um, yeah, this is also an opportunity for some that would like to ask some question. Um, you can spend the time doing that as well. Uh, yeah, Maria, when you want to proceed, feel free to manage the time. Okay. Just seeing if there's anything in the chat or did you answer them all? Did we answer them? I mean, uh, oh, did you? The question? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So there was someone asking about normalization. I will say, there other to the question, will you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the question, uh, I answer in the text. I mean, a, 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 a better answer is now bulk RNA sequencing has become quite cheap, although it's not getting cheaper and cheaper. The real uh, limitation in producing data is actually the experiment itself. If you want to gather clinical samples, they might be rare. If you want to organize uh, in vivo experiments based on mice, uh, they are really expensive. So that's the bottleneck. Um, the, here we are using toy, as you said, um, data sets, mostly because uh, RStudio Cloud um, is quite limited in the memory uh, that he has. But, you know, in the future, we will tune up and try to um, provide uh, some more interesting data sets um, to play with uh, if, the, if the memory requirements uh, allow it.
someone is getting a memory error when trying to use the Pasilla data set. Uh, can they can they clean the can they clean the variables at this stage? What do you mean by clean the variables? Uh, I mean eliminating all the objects they produced so far. Um, at, at this stage. Let me see. I'm going to do a bit with count scales, but I mean, they don't have to do that bit. And then we start again. So yeah, you can eliminate any objects you've created up to now. I'm, I, I don't know if the ggplot style will, uh, will have to be reloaded, but it's not going to be hard. Okay. C stack usage. Stack usage. Yeah, this error is uh, often not related to actual um, object themselves, but some coding error that results in. It's a bit strange to see this error here. But it could well be the memory issue, um, although we tested everything. Um, I'm just going to run that so that it works. So one thing I would like to mention, because that mm -hmm. error that uh, Matt is having, I'm sure is Matt, um, yes, uh, can be due to uh, to, how can I say, incompatibility or um, to the fact that dependencies start to fight to each other. So R doesn't have a incredibly robust dependency, dependency structure, meaning that sometime uh, you have to load some package before others, okay? Uh, for example, if, if in your own analysis you load tidyverse, and then you load annotation packages from uh, Biconductor. There are many functions that will replace, mutate, select, and so on. And you can often see uh, C stack usage error. Okay, this is also true for tidybulk because tidybulk is putting a layer over tidyverse. Okay, if you want to load independently dplyr, tidyr, and tidyverse you should place library tidybulk at the end, okay? Because tidybulk, it is compatible with normal tables, but it's not the other way around um, necessary, okay? Uh, so it, again, it's complex, but just a heads up that sometimes the, if you load one library and then reload something else and so on, you can get quite messy. Uh, although in my day-to-day -day analysis, I, I don't tell it, so you, you kind of learn how to some few uh, details to respect. Oh, thanks, uh, Phil. Put a comment in. Very cool workflow, and it went hundred percent. Okay, that's good to hear. Oh, it was great. It was great. Um, we can. Uh, what do you think? Uh, do we leave some time, or uh, I mean, the the exercise might be a bit um, not super easy for everybody. Uh, I, and I'm not sure. yeah. yeah, I feel like we sh should move on because um, otherwise, yeah, we will go way. Um, and yeah. for your parts. So, okay, you're sharing the results. Okay, what is cool. the fraction of variance? Um, yeah, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, what is the fraction of variance for PC1? So most people are saying 32. Now, let me just double check. Um, so it should actually be 40, 0 0.47. So the 33% are right. And if anybody has seen or discovered the solutions tab, 
um, where we do actually have all the solutions for these exercises if you do want to keep or use afterwards. That, that answer is actually wrong in there at the minute. I need to fix it. It says 30, around 32, I think, but yeah, 0.47 is the right. Okay. And how many differentially expressed genes are there? There should be, let me check, um, 1128. Okay, so 33%. Is it the same 33% that have gotten both right? Maybe. And what is the gene ID of the 10th most differentially expressed gene? So it is the first one, 0071. So half of you got that right. Well done. Okay, so yeah, I think we'll move on. With the next part now we were going to take a five minute break but maybe will we save the break for after part two yeah yeah okay yeah yeah that's a good idea okay so i'll, I'll keep going on okay so thanks for those of you who had to go with that uh example and so we're actually going to see this Priscilla data set used now in the next part. So this is showing you some things you can do with tidybook that um, are quite nice. And so before I get into that, though, I will explain something that you're going to see here. So this is um, a, a tidybook provides these two modes. So I'll explain what it is. So we're going to see action equals get getting added to some functions, getting used with some functions. And this is tidy bulk. Every tidy bulk function takes a tidy bulk tibble. The default is to use action add. So that's what we've been using so far. So where we were getting the new information added to our input table. And then in some cases we were using pivot sample or pivot transcript to then extract the sample or transcript specific information from the table. Okay, so, and this is an example of explaining the difference here. So for example, if we had our count scale objects and we were creating the PCA, if we use the default action equals add, this is what we saw before, we would end up with our input table that has a row for every transcript in every sample. So over 100,000 rows, and we have our PC one and two information columns added at the end. However, if we used action equals get instead, what we would see instead is just the eight rows. So the information, the PC information for each sample. Okay, so we're gonna see action equals get, get used a few times here instead of having to do the pivot afterwards. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is something that's really cool with TidyBulk in that it integrates several of the most popular RNA sequencing analysis uh, algorithms. So these are all available as separate packages. There's EdgeR, there's Lima, there's DC2, as we mentioned before, and TidyBulk provides an interface to, to letting you choose which one you want to use. So you could use TidyBulk to pick your favorite and analyze your data with that. And the benefit is you get to analyze it in the tidyverse way, or you can actually use it to, to run multiple of these algorithms and then compare the results. Um, because often people aren't sure which, is, which one they should use. And quite often they might just use the one that um, people around them, people they know use. So here, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna load in a few additional libraries that we're gonna use. And we're going to use that Priscilla data set that came from the exercises. So this is doing similar things to what we did in part one. So we're going to take our input data, create our tidy book table. We're going to add our gene symbols and we're going to filter for our uh, transcripts with adequate abundance using the um, condition column. And then this is similar to what we saw before. We're going to test for differential expression and give it a formula. In this case, condition is got our treated and untreated groups and type is for um, the sequencing, type of sequencing that was done, paired end or single end. 
So we'll include that. And this time we're going to use action equals get just to get the transcript specific information. And then we're going to sort by p-value. Okay, so that's just running one method similar to what we did before, get our differentially expressed results. But now we can actually perform multiple of the methods on this data set and see how they compare. So I'm just going to start that running. Okay, so we've got the EDGAR quasi likelihood method available and also the EDGAR likelihood ratio. We've got Limavoom and we've got DC2. So in this case, we're going to run the test testing for each of these methods and use the pipe to combine the outputs. And we're using a prefix, which is going to be added to let us know which columns came from, which output columns came from which method. Okay, so if we take a look at that, so you can see we've got our, all our columns from our, the different methods added at the end. So now we can have a look and compare them. And I've just got a note here to say that um, you might notice that some of the columns have um, different names for the same thing. So for example, EDGAR calls the adjusted p-value column FTR. And Moon calls it adjusted dot p value and DC2 calls it p adjust. And this is uh, how the packages output it. So Tidybook is providing them back for you, but you can use Tidybook to rename if you wanted to, to rename. And we have another little poll here that is going to let you see or going to give you a chance to see which method. Now that you have the opportunity to run all, which method has the, detects the most differentially expressed genes? So, and that's differentially expressed genes using the adjusted p-value of less than 0.05. So whether it's FDR, adjusted p-value, or p-adjust, they all mean the same thing in these output columns. So if I, would you mind launching that poll? And that's the last poll of my section. And we'll just pause again for a minute and see if anybody's got any questions on the running the different methods. Uh, yeah, just a comment on this uh, exercise. This can, this can be done in two ways. Uh, one is kind of self-contained where you can reshape the data, group the data, count, uh, summarize, sorry. Or you can uh, iterate through the different algorithms. Uh, yeah, to the different methods. And the final part of this part two, before I hand over to Stefan now, we'll be showing you some ways to visualize the data. This output here, I mean, comparison of the different tools. Um. Maria Pitt asks, uh, do we have some more information about the data sets we are uh, using? I mean, I, I think we have linked to resources now because the, the data set we are using are public, uh, really commonly yeah. used data sets for benchmarking. So the two of them are, yeah, I've referenced both of them. So I've referenced both the studies they come from. So um, if you look at the actual rendered version of the workshop and on the workshop tab, uh, because it doesn't show up in the R Markdown version, so you have to actually render it. And if you go to the very, very, very bottom, we should actually should use the. Oh, I don't have a sidebar. Okay, so if you can see, can you see my screen? You have a whole lot of references, and one of those is for the airway data set, and one is for the Scylla data set. Yes, yeah, so, so the workshop, uh, as Maria said, renders really nicely into a, a GitHub website. 
and I encourage you to go there um, to see the, the kind of after the workshop is better you doing interactively here, but to yeah. see a nice uh, layout of the whole thing is, is more aesthetically pleasing in a way to go through and read it again. Cool, I think uh, we can end the polling. It's like just 23%, but we can, uh, we can get going. Yep, okay, and edge our likelihood ratio was correct, so half, half of you got it. So Congrats. Nice. Yeah, so that method is the less stringent of the, of the four. Okay. Okay, so, so now we can actually, we can actually make plots to, to see how the methods compare. So we can take our table that has all the columns from the methods, we can select our four, so our log full change columns from each of the four methods, and then we can use this handy ggpairs function from the ggalley package to, um, com to compare them all, we'll do pairwise comparisons for us, and we can get a plot like this that we can visualize how they compare. So we can see in this case, all the methods are fairly similar in their log full change um, results for this data set. There's a couple of points you might want to have a closer look at. And, but if we want to compare the significance rather than the effect, so in this case, we're extracting the p-value columns. And again, using ggpair to visualize the comparison, we can see, oops, so in this case, the edge are the two edge are methods. So the edge are quasi likelihood and the edge are likelihood ratio are fairly similar to each other, but we see greater differences comparing edge are and D seek to limazoom. And we um, can select some of the transcripts if we want to look at them a bit closer. And there's a package that Stefano has developed called Tidygate which allows you to interactively select points in a plot and add the information on these um, selections to your table. So I'll show you what that means now. So Tidygate has this function called gate and you use it to create your, in this case, a scatter plot. Say how opaque do you want the points to be for visualizing and how many gates do you want to draw? So I'm going to this won't work in the R Markdown document, but I'm going to put it in the console and run it and show you what happens. You can do it too if you want. Oops. Okay, if I run that here. So I should get in my plots pane. Oops. Oh, so this mark region on a plot, so it wants me to draw and select points. So I need to click. I'm going to click here, here here, here, and then click escape when I'm finished. So that will draw a gate around the points I've selected. Probably didn't select them too well. And I said I wanted to draw two gates, so it gave, gave me a prompt to select more. So I'm clicking and escape when I'm done. And now I should have another gate. So now I've got two gates of selected points. And the ones on the left, which are, which are gonna be called gate one, are the transcripts that are more significant in um, edge R than D seek two, so the lower lower p-value in edge R. And these ones over here, the gate two, are more significant in D seek two. So they've got higher p-values in edge R. So we can have a closer look at these. So if I go back to my R markdown, oops. Okay, so I'm just gonna show that there's a screenshot here that's in the rendered version as well that shows selecting the points probably better than I did there. And there's a block here where I'm gonna load in some pre-selected points just for the sake of the plots in the next part. So this is adding on better gates than what I drew. And what we're doing here, what I'm doing here is seeing how many points, how many transcripts do I have in my two selected gates. So I've got five. Sorry, Maria. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, 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 um, it can be obvious, but just to specify, uh, obviously this is, a, uh, this is a kind of an example, but if we compare different methods, uh, there are some methods that do not agree for some uh, genes. So we might want to uh, select specific genes in the visualization uh, for them, uh, for then uh, plotting, for example, raw data about them and so on. So to explore the reason why that might be the, uh, you know, that might be the case. Yep, thank you. Yeah, I didn't explain why I was doing this very well. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we want to have a closer look at these points and then, yeah, look at the raw data to see if there's any um, reason behind why they might be different in the methods. Okay, so here what we're going to do now is generate the strip charts like we did before. So look at the counts for these individual transcripts. So here we're just getting rid of the points we didn't select, not in any gate, and then giving the gates better names. So more significant in EDGAR, more significant in DC2, and then doing some ordering of the order we want the plots before we actually make our. Um, plot similar strip chart similar to we, how we did it before. So then this enables us like Stefano was saying there of having a closer look at the raw values to see um, what we think of them, and whether we believe one particular method more. And we can extract out, um, for example, one of the transcripts and have a closer look to see, okay, in this case, DC2 is more conservative in the log flow change it's assigning to that transcript. Um, than HR. Okay, so at this point, um, I'm going to hand over to Stefano and he is going to take you through the rest, the second part of the workshop. Um, so I will stop sharing and let Stefano start sharing. Right, thanks, Maria. Pretty well done. Um, so let me see. Okay. Uh, are you guys able to see my screen? Yep. Okay. All right. So uh, what I, I will do um, from now on is to complete the second part of this um, extended analysis, a bit uh, higher level about uh, bulk RNA sequencing. And then uh, give a brief overview uh, of another package that he used to do similar things, but for single cell um, RNA sequencing. So the last topic about bulk RNA sequencing um, is uh, analyzing the uh, tissue composition of our samples, right? So why we would like to do that? Um, as an example, the composition of the tissue microenvironment in uh, cancer have been shown to be really important for disease progression. Uh, but there are many examples where uh, we would like to know uh, what type of cells are uh, in uh, our um, biological replicates uh, to understand better and, and to gather more information from our data. So um, for this section, uh, we will use um, again a, another data set. Uh, ah, here we go. You see, it's doing it again. Anyway, it might load, it will take a few seconds. Uh, we will use a data set uh, that is a subset of the breast cancer data set from TCGA, which is a, a, a consortium uh, that sequences uh, sequenced uh, thousands and thousands of patients. Um, and so uh, we will use that data set to analyze its uh, cellularity composition. Um, so, uh, well, what can I say? I will, uh, yeah, here is the code, so I can talk about it more directly. Uh, yeah, so the first thing we do uh, is to load our data sets. Now I will show you, it's taking some time, but uh, the first thing we will do in a minute uh, is to convert it into, again, a, table, a tidy bulk table, um, specifying what uh, the sample column, transcript column, and transcript abundance column are, as usual. Let's see if it uh, allows me to do it. Let's 
quickly. I will show you in a second. I can tell you already, as you can see in this second code chunk, that uh, again, it's quite straightforward and verbose to perform this operation with Tidyball. Uh, we just call the function the convolve cellularity on this data set. Uh, again, uh, this uh, function underlies several different methods that uh, can be used alternatively. Uh, by default, uh, this uses uh, CyberSort, which is, a, I would say, the gold standard for uh, inferring tissue composition from mixed um, samples. Uh, and with the uh, operation that is called deconvolution uh, and is in, in this uh, for CyberSort is based on uh, support vector regression, just so you know. Uh, and uh, beside choosing different algorithms, you, we can choose different ref cell type reference as all these methods are based on uh, a reference of uh, uh, transcriptomic signatures that are proper of each cell type. For example, T cells have a peculiar uh, transcriptomic signatures, monocytes have another, so on and so forth. So in this case, by default, we are using uh, one that is called LM22, uh, that is also part of CyberSort package, and it includes 22 immune cells from uh, peripheral blood. Okay, let's try again. Seems we're doing it. A few seconds to complete the, uh, the convolution. And I can show you here the original data set and the new column we have added. So as you can see, we have a patient ID, uh, some uh, survival information we will use um, just uh, in a minute. And uh, here TidyBulk has added uh, column-wise uh, all um, proportion for 22 cell types. Again, we are choosing action get uh, because we want to analyze um, uh, cell type proportion from now on, we don't care about transcript abundance anymore, okay? In the original data set, so just, uh, you know, uh, there is uh, transcript information too, okay? Sorry, Steph, no question in the chat. What is the event occurred column? Yeah, I will explain in a minute. Uh, we will do some survival analysis. I will explain what it is and, um, and what those columns are, are just for... Um, the next analysis we will do. So now we have this cell type proportion for each of our patients. Uh, we can go on and do a an statistical analysis on those and data exploration. For, we can do a lot of things. This is just an example. Uh, we might want for, uh, the, for uh, making the analysis more modular, again, to reshape this data, uh, to make it a bit more ID like So the 22 columns we will reshape to have just two, as I will show you now. Uh, cell type column and proportion column. So you can now imagine that we can produce faceted plot pretty easily. We can do summary statistics based on each cell type and so on. Here we want to produce a summary plot. This will be a, a bar plot uh, with just few lines uh, of ggplot code. Uh, I will show you here the result. Because our data is, is shaped in a tidy way, it's really easy to ggplot to produce quite informative um, visualizations in an easy way. So in this case, on the x-axis, we have uh, our patients. On the y-axis, we have our proportion. Uh, and basically, we are producing bar plots that are stacked uh, with the cell type information. And the color coding is about cell types. And uh, we can already see here what are the overall more, uh, most abundant cell types in breast cancer tissues. And uh, we can see here that there are some outliers in their composition compared to other, um, other samples, so on and so forth. Um, so we don't stop here. We can, we can do hypothesis testing on these cell type proportions as we did for transcript abundance. Uh, before we wanted to do to uh, identify association between some transcript abundance and uh, some treatment state, uh, here uh, we might uh, well actually yeah I skipping this code. Uh, 
before hypothesis testing, we can explore further the data. Similarly, again, to what we have done before, we can reduce the dimension. Instead of using transcript information, we use cell type information to visualize in two dimension, for example, the distribution of samples to identify uh, which samples are more, um, have more similar composition to the other. So what I'm doing here is to use reduced dimension exactly as before. Uh, I will tell you uh, which column I'm using. Um, we are just adding these three rows. This is normally not needed, uh, but in this case, we are using cyber sort algorithm, which then the for rare cell type outputs uh, exactly zero. So some cell type might have zero variance. Okay, so many algorithms, if you do standard analysis uh, like PCA, do not like uh, zero variance uh, elements. In this case, just we filtered out uh, the uninformative cell types. That's what we're doing. Uh, we use reduced dimension. Um, in this case, we specify ourselves the column uh, for sample, which is patient in our case, uh, the feature column, which is cell type, and the value column, which is proportion. Uh, we choose the PCA reduced dimension algorithm. Again, we just uh, interested in sample wise information and we plot uh, the PCA in two dimensions. As you can see here, it's pretty easy to see that there are two patients that are kind of outlier based on their tissue composition and the rest are quite evenly distributed. So you can see here that uh, a lot of the function that uh, we offer with TidyBulk can be uh, repurposed for, um, uh, for different uh, data types. Okay, so we have the first poll of this um, last part. So what is the most abundant cell type overall in our uh, data set? So can we launch this poll? And uh, as before, uh, a tip uh, is um, because we have reshaped the data, you can easily uh, group the data um, and uh, produce summary statistics uh, to answer this question. Stefano, I have a question for you. Um, there's a question. With CyberSort, since the signatures were derived from blood, can they be used with tumor samples to get useful results? Well, that's, um, that's a complicated question. Invo is, is not about data analysis, but it involves uh, you know, some bi biological evaluations. Um, I would say generally, yes. So the principle of these algorithms, um, as I design one myself, uh, is that the signatures you identify uh, include uh, genes which transcription is solid uh, and ab ab absolutely identify uh, that cell type in the, um, in the hierarchy of, um, of cell type differentiation. So those markers ideally do not change no matter where those cell types are. Uh, obviously, there are variations that are accounting to as noise, and uh, we use, there is balance on uh, the size of our signatures to allow uh, fluctuations and uh, do reliable statistics. So the short answer is yes, but is 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 obviously complicated. It depends uh, on on case by case. Uh, share the results with you. So the majority. Um, I, I think they guess the, uh, the, they, they uh, identify the right answer, which is uh, macrophages M0 phenotype. Okay. Uh, so as I was uh, stop here. So as I was mentioning before, now we have done some data exploration. Another thing we have done similarly to uh, what we have done with transcript information is to do hypothesis testing. For example, which are the cell types that are associated with the disease progression or with survival or with um, metastasis relapse? 
And uh, these cell types might um, represent drivers of the disease. So this is quite important. Is an area of research that is incredibly active and is gaining traction in the really recent years. So the, the tissue microenvironment uh, has been shown to be a really key for uh, a lot of diseases. Okay, so again, I will just uh, show you the data set we have so far. Now, what is the column um, time and event occurred? So uh, in our case, the time is time to relapse. So uh, the patient normally gets a disease. Uh, this is breast cancer, so it might be different for different cancers, but generally the patient get the uh, primary cancer in the site, in this case in the breast. Uh, they do some treatment and they might or they might not relapse. Okay, so the time is um, how much time it passed uh, after uh, the treatment before the patient relapsed. Okay, so some, some patients relapse really early because they have really incredibly aggressive cancers. Some patients never relapsed. So in this case, we do a survival, survival analysis where some, uh, for some samples, the time information is known because they did relapse. And for some patient is unknown, it might happen in the future. And so what survival analysis, and in this case, Cox regression uh, analysis will do is to take into account what are the known or unknown or so-called sensor data, okay? So you imagine the time on the x-axis and the cell type proportion on the y, and you are seeking for some uh, correlation. So in this case, again, the user interface is quite uh, consistent. Uh, the function is called test differential cellularity. Again, we uh, plug in a formula uh, that corresponds to a linear model. Uh, in this case, we are using the survival package, uh, but for other analysis, a normal linear regression, uh, a standard linear regression might, might su uh, suffice. So, in this case, we are, co uh, we are calling serve uh, function from survival package that I'm loading here, uh, specifying the time and the, whether the event is occurred or not. Two seconds. This test has, has been uh, performed for each cell type. We visualize the results. Uh, I select a few columns for clarity um, to you. So we can, we can see here that we have a, set, a cell type column, a p-value relative to the statistics, other, p other statistics here of the Cox regression that is underlying this uh, function in this case, uh, and a cell type proportion column that uh, it co includes some compressed uh, Get some information in a compressed way that we can extract, and I will show you later. Okay, so uh, we can see here, for example, that uh, the most associated cell type with survival is uh, natural killer cells resting, and the second one is uh, CD4 T cells uh, memory activated. Here, the statistics are not amazing because we just had 20. Uh, roughly 20, 30 samples. Um, the real breast cancer TCGA data sets includes more than a thousand. So you can imagine that uh, you can have much better uh, statistics um, using the, the actual data. Uh, we create a visualization here to um, summarize uh, the raw data for the two, first two cell types. As before, uh, we might want, uh, okay, we see that two cell types might be associated with survival. We, we might want to plot the raw data, so plot the proportions uh, per sample of this data and seek a, a visually, a, a hopefully, a, an association. So what we do here, line by line, is to select for the first two cell types. Uh, we want to plot the proportion themselves that are here compressed in this column. We can use the nest um, function from IDR. And you can see here that now we have patient 
and proportion information. Okay. And then we, we just uh, produce scatter plots, as I showed you. Uh, you can see here that uh, we have some, uh, some sort of association. We can see uh, that are positively associated uh, as we, uh, we, might, um, you know, we might see from the statistics themselves. Uh, again, one nice thing of using uh, tidyverse for visualizing is that we can produce quite complex scale for the X or Y axis without the need to transform the data. And so lose some sort of grip on the information we want to convey to, uh, to our users. Uh, so here the time in this case is uh, log transforms as the model uh, takes log, log transform um, time uh, scales. In this case is uh, the number of days. And proportion, um, here uh, is transformed as a, as a logit uh, because is um, is constrained between uh, zero and one. We want to, in a way, uh, make it um, uh, make it more linear in an unbounded space. Uh, and uh, again, we actually are vi visualizing the proportion value directly, not some uh, logit transformation of them. Okay, so uh, this is another example of um, a way uh, you can use uh, tidyball to do some analysis that uh, would take some time, and, and they might be tedious uh, to operate, um, going through a lot of that integration and, and complex data reshaping, a lot of variables create, so on and so forth. Okay, so some key points uh, of this uh, last, um, last part is that tidybots allow streamlined multi-method analysis as Maria showed. Uh, tidy gates allows the selection of arbitrary points in a two dimension. Uh, this is often uh, useful if uh, clustering methods do not uh, pinpoint the data we want to analyze. We can actually manually get them. Um, and tidy bulk allows easy analysis uh, of setup composition as we've seen and uh, allows hypothesis testing on this uh, new inference. Um, again, we, um, we don't have exercises for this uh, second part, but um, we encourage uh, some questions if you have. We take a couple of minutes of break. Thanks, Stefano. We could also give people a chance for a short break, like take like five minutes if they want to go and get a drink or have a stretch. Amazing, because um, I need a, I need a tea. <laughs> you need a tea? So, okay, so everyone, how about, so if you've got any questions for Stefano, hang on to them because um, you can ask them when we come back or the next part three is single cell for about 30-ish minutes and then the remaining time is free for you if you want to stay and ask questions. So okay. we'll take can five we minutes. One thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can we do one thing? Can we make the, can we uh, add the questions now so I stay, I stick on the video um, and then when everybody's satisfied we take just 30 seconds, uh, I mean even more of, of a break and uh, you, you uh, stick with us because we have single cell uh, analysis that it might be even more interesting for many people than both. Okay, yeah, yeah, sounds good. Okay, so if anyone's got any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat now for this part here. Okay, so I'm not sure, um, okay, um, what questions are the new ones? Because I haven't, I haven't uh, looked at the chat for some time. What is the event core column? Okay, that we answered that. Wow, this is magic. That's true. Um, okay, so uh, in CyberSort, since the signatures were derived from blood. Ah, okay, sorry. Is we answered that. You answered that one, yeah. Not directly for today, but how did you set up pulse? Okay. Uh, 
I have not seen them before. Hopefully, for of, uh, helpful for teaching, that's right. It's really good. Uh, you can ask Phil. Um, the organizers are really good. Um, I mean, they actually um, they were they were organizing them. So maybe Phil can comment this question. Yeah, yeah. What what, uh, what was the question? I'm just sitting here looking through the. Catalog. So uh, they like the polls. I mean, they might say not for now, but they want to know. Um, uh, how did you set up the polls? Ah, uh, yes, yes, that's a fantastic question. Uh, so we worked ahead of time with the instructors and we basically said, if you wanna provide polls, just let us know. And I think your team sent those to us and Vola who's on, uh, she just plugs those into um, to Zoom. And I think um, as long as you're like the, the administrator account or the, the main account, you, you can set up polls. Um, yesterday, um, I think we had some workshops that use them too. So sometimes the instructors will do them. Sometimes the um, people helping with the conference uh, will do them. Um, but they're a nice way to uh, to utilize uh, Zoom. Um, and to be honest, we were originally going to teach the workshops with our conference platform, um, but we had got some feedback that people really liked the experience via Zoom. So uh, we went ahead and used Zoom. And uh, and also it provides op opportunities for breakout rooms and that type of thing. So um, that is that is just something that um, that you can do within Zoom. So. Stefano, I think a bit more to that question might have been how did we set up the polls in the R Markdown? So just to clarify that they they are just a formatting of the poll, how it looks in the rendered document is what the the poll bit in the RMD in the R Markdown is doing. It's not actually triggering those polls to pop up. They are there from Zoom, so I think I think that I think someone might think that they're coming from the R Markdown. I got you. Yeah. So it's not that calling a Zoom good. function from R Markdown. We're not that. We're not that good. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> it's good if it looked like that. <laughs> That's the next package to come out of R and Pharma: the uh, Zoom polling, R Markdown <laughs> plugin. So. Good. That's how good we are. All, you know, it's all like magic. Things happen. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and and on the, uh, it's like middle of the night for you too. So all of that, you know, at two a.m. What what time is it for you right now? It's just turned one. Just ah, late night. <laughs> it's still it's still early. <laughs> so I. I encourage people to ask any questions in the next maybe 30 seconds, anything, uh, even suggestions. Um, again, I remind, I will remind later, but I, uh, I, I actually, um, who, um, I will put in the chat the GitHub repository for, um, for tidy bulk. Uh, if not now, you can ask questions um, and, um, Propose new feature requests, uh, critics, and uh, hopefully contribute to the repository uh, in the GitHub directly. Uh, and I will post the repository here. Okay, so let's take uh, one minute break, a couple of minutes break. Um, and then uh, we will be back for the last part that is single cell RNA sequencing analysis in a tidy way. I think that's about five minutes by my count. So you could maybe start again if you want. Cool, all right. So let's start the last um, section of this workshop. Okay, so, so far we have talked about um, bulk RNA sequencing. Uh, what is usually done, for example, on uh, clinical research uh, is uh, for bulk RNA sequences is to take a tissue, for example, homogenize it, uh, extract RNA from it, uh, sequencing um, and sequencing the, the, the mRNA molecule content of the sample. In this way, we uh, lose the information about um, how many cell types th there were in the samples and what mRNA molecule were coming from which cell. 
And so we have seen that we have some uh, quite powerful inference methods, such as the convolution, to try to identify, uh, to be go backwards in a way, to try to identify uh, the cell type proportionalities that, that it was in our sample. However, this is quite challenging. Um, a lot more information could be extracted from the data if just we had a way to link each mRNA molecule with each cell. And this is what single cell uh, RNA sequencing uh, allowed in uh, the, the, the recent years. This uh, is, um, is quite a revolution in the clinical research. Um, as uh, again, it allows to have a much better um, landscape of the heterogeneity within each sample um, that we sequence. So here there is just an image, as you can see, uh, we, what we do with bulk RNA is just to get an average of our sample. Uh, for, for single cell, we actually resolve the single cell uh, mRNA content, okay? Um, so obviously the, uh, the literature on single cell um, genetics is huge. Here we want to show you just an example of a simple workflow you can do and how some of the tools we develop um, uh, facilitate it. Okay, so um, I won't, I won't uh, list them, but you can see here some of the key steps to a single cell um, RNA sequencing analysis. So you can see here that there is um, uh, clustering involved, cell type classification, extent of cell type inference. Um, again, we see this test differential cellularity, but we can do some uh, more sophisticated things uh, such as cell lineage, cell lineage trajectory analysis, uh, as cell cell interaction and so on. Okay, so this is a, a, a really rough picture of, of single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, a, there are a few popular workflows for single cell RNA sequencing. Um, roughly speaking, uh, there is SURAT, uh, which is published in CRAN, and it is a quite, um, a quite user friendly uh, framework that allows to do virtually uh, all the steps, all the main steps in, in uh, the analysis that you need. And then there are um, a list of, of frameworks in the Biconductor repository. They do um, analogous things. For this workshop, we will use Surat. Uh, I will explain a bit more later. And we'll also use Tidy Surat. Okay, before we have seen Tidy Bulk, uh, which is basically offers a tidy representation of transcriptomic data, but uh, is mostly a workflow. So a framework that offers a, a full workflow. Okay, uh, Tidy Surat has much, uh, has much um, specific goal, is not a workflow, is, is in this case an adapter. Uh, maybe I will talk to you uh, more about where we, when we have the code, but, but is not a, uh, analogous to Tidy Ball for single cell. The analogous to Tidyball for single cell, we will be producing even also based on Tidy Surat, and it will be likely called a Tidy Single Cell. Uh, but this is not what Tidy Surat it is, so I don't want to create confusion here. Um, okay, so I will explain a bit more uh, the data content of single cell uh, RNA sequencing and uh, a bit more about Surat as well. So uh, we, will we are loading some libraries specific for single cell. And for this last part, uh, we are using a uh, data set called PBMC in small, uh, because it is a subset of a bigger PBMC data set. Uh, PBMC uh, stands for peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which is a collection of immune cells that is present in a fraction of the blood. So this, um, data set is actually a Surat object. So Surat S is on object uh, container and as well is on a workflow where analysis can be performed. 
So let's see uh, what this object looks like. Okay, this object is quite um, complex. Uh, here is just printing you out few information. So the point uh, that uh, I, I specifically am not crazy for is that it, it, it really detaches the user from the information content. Basically, we don't get much information from visualizing the object. Okay, just so you know, this object is huge, is a S4 object uh, that is hardly, um, sorry, I do structure. Uh, I mean, you can see here that is really huge. So uh, a, a, a good thing that is optimized, so uh, his memory footprint is pretty low, but as you can see, it's not easy to interact with it, okay? So Tidy Surat, um, adds a thin layer on this object that allows uh, to interface to this object as if it was if it were a table uh, so we can visualize it as a table and manipulate it with all tidyverse ecosystem again not compromising the original um, the original functionality because on the back end it remains a surat object as i will show to you all right so we just use the tidy surat tidy function uh, and now, how does this object look like? Okay, now we have some more information exposed. In this case, the cell uh, wise information. Uh, if for bulk RNA sequencing, the key columns, the key elements are samples, so biological replicates and transcripts. Here we have a further layer. We have samples, cells, and transcripts. Uh, we can see here the sample specified. Few more, um, few more um, descriptive statistics that Surat calculates internally. So we are exposing what the Surat object information um, content is. And you can see here that we have two groups in this data set, um, and uh, we have uh, the file uh, where this um, data comes from. Yeah, you can explore a bit more on your own. Uh, okay, to prove that this is actually a Surat object, we can use a say uh, object from Surat to uh, query it. You can see here that we get out what we would expect. So there is one assay. So it is one uh, transcript abundance uh, column in a way, and it's called RNA. Okay, we will have scaled RNA, we will have adjusted RNA and so on. Okay, so um, again, uh, we can, with this object, we can both interface Surat platform and Tidyverse platform seamlessly. For example, let's say we want to polish a bit our data set. We have two groups, it's called G1 and G2. Let's say we don't want the G letter over there, we don't need it. So we do as if, uh, as the same way we would do with any table, we mutate and we, we remove the G. And as well, we want to extract the sample ID from this complex uh, file path. We do with extract. Um, and you can see here that, uh, you know, what is presented to us is just sample, uh, sample ID, which is one and two, and group ID, which is also one and two in this case. So we have polished a bit our data set. Now we want to start analyzing it. For it, we will use straight Surat uh, platform. Um, okay, so uh, similarly to the bulk RNA analysis, we might want to scale the data uh, because some cell types are uh, physically bigger, so produce more RNA. Um, and uh, it can be argued whether scaling, scaling based on cell size is a loss of biological information. That's another topic, but uh, is often done. So as example, we call SCT transform with these arguments that has the effect of scaling the data. And we call find uh, variable genes, again, from Surat to find the variable uh, transcript, so the informative transcript in our data set. Because uh, single cell uh, RNA sequencing is a really sparse um, data set, so there are a lot of zeros. Uh, as the depth of sequencing for each cell is not huge, uh, we often need to not consider most of the information. I mean, zero is not actually information, but most of the data. 
Uh, again, we can see here that few columns have been added. Um, yeah, so the scale data, some, uh, some su summary statistics, for example, um, what's what the tra overall transmit abundance and the number of features uh, for each cell. Okay, so we have kind of pre-processed this data. Now, as before, we can reduce the dimension uh, of this data and for single cell is even more important because the dimensionality is huge. We have thousands of cells, four thousands of transcripts and often four tens of hundreds of uh, biological replicates. So to visualize this data is quite challenging. Uh, and so we can, again, we keep using surats as if, if it, this object was uh, a straight surat object as it, it actually underlies. Uh, we uh, use RAM PCA, um, similarly to, to, to bulk RNA, but uh, there are uh, different techniques for single cell RNA uh, that are not linear and um, help to visualize, to represent the better the neighborhood in between cells. Um, while PCA is a kind of a linear uh, dimensionality reduction, uh, often the, uh, the neighborhood of cell clusters are not well resolved as a consequence of this. Um, and so there are other te techniques like TISNI and UMAP that favors uh, neighborhood resolution. And these are not linear. Uh, we use UMAP in this case because it has been recognized as, yes, is resolved the, na resolved the neighborhood, but respects also the long distance, um, the long distances. Uh, so we can uh, look at this data set now. Uh, again, uh, there's like a table. You can see here that uh, PCA um, as standard, we visualize the first five to not overwhelm the, the user and UMAP, uh, the three UMAP that we want you to calculate um, dimensions are also here. Okay, so we have used Surat so far. Uh, to visualize this information, we decided to, uh, to switch to the tidyverse ecosystem and we use Plotly uh, just at, for showcasing uh, you know, the possibilities and the power of this uh, tidyverse ecosystem. We decided we want to produce an interactive 3D plot of the first three UMAP dimensions. Again, this is a, a quite uh, simple data set. So you won't get blown away by this, uh, but for a big data set, this can be quite uh, a lifesaver. So you can see here that uh, we can identify roughly three clusters in this data. And we might wonder what this, this uh, each dot is a cell, okay? So we might wonder what this cluster uh, represents in terms of cell population. Okay, so another important step of single cell uh, sequencing um, analysis is the, identify, uh, the identification of the cluster. So now we have uh, visually recognized three cluster presence here. Again, this is quite simple data set, uh, but we want to do it in a quantitative way. Uh, so again, we can use Surat for this. Uh, we use the function identify neighbors and a, a fine cluster uh, that use uh, SNN uh, method, which is a graph-based method. And again, it's nonlinear. Uh, Surat has a, a great documentation, so um, you can find more details on all these functions and all the underlying methods uh, on their website. It is quite great. Uh, okay, so let's perform this uh, cluster uh, identification. Again, let's look, let's look at our data. Uh, and we have a further column uh, as uh, Surat object is, is populated in the back end. And uh, we have, uh, again, we have the cluster ID as, as integer. Let's uh, use Tidyverse to uh, count how many cells are present in each cluster. That's quite simple. Okay, we want to, um, specify also the sample and the group information um, if we wish, otherwise we can uh, build a, a more summary statistics. We can say here that we have uh, four clusters 
and cluster zero and cluster one are the biggest one. And there is not much difference between the two samples. Okay, so let's step forward. We have now identified that there are four clusters. Well, I, I, I kind of say three. Uh, I'm wondering where the other cluster is. So we might easily uh, add coloring to these plots using the cluster column to identify what the four clusters were inferred. Another important point is now we want to understand what their, uh, those clusters are in terms of uh, cell type identity. Some cluster might be T cells, some cluster might be cancer cells, so on and so forth. So usually we can do this with two different strategies. Uh, a more manually curated strategy where we identify what uh, gene um, transcripts uh, are exclusively abundant in one cluster and we can use our knowledge or the literature to understand that a transcript is uniquely um, transcribed in uh, T cells. Here we go. Or uh, we can use a more automated way where similar to the, the convolution we used before, we use reference cell type signatures to, in this case, uh, classify. So we, uh, we attribute each cell type as a specific, uh, sorry, each cell as specific cell type. So we can obtain uh, tissue composition information from single cell and is a much more direct observation of tissues, uh, uh, tissue composition rather than inference from bulk RNA. Um, all right, so let's uh, see, first of all, the more manually curation, curated uh, procedure. So as I um, mentioned before, we can identify what are the, uh, the gene markers that are exclusively of preferentially transcribed in one cluster versus the others. We use find marker genes from Surat, and then we switch to tidyverse to select the first 10 uh, marker genes from each cluster, so for a total of 40. Okay, so we are seamlessly, seeming, uh, seamlessly integrating uh, two different frameworks <coughs> with no problem. So what the marker data uh, frame look like, uh, there are some statistics on the, um, gene marker identification and the column we are interested in is gene, okay? Uh, and so we can plot a heat map, really informative using Surat do heat map using our marker genes. Um, okay, so we see what we would hope to see that are a cluster of, in this case, 10 gene for each, um, which cluster that are preferentially transcribed in uh, um, each of them and not in the other. And we might, um, we might try to seek information in the literature about different markers. For example, we have CD3D here. So we might assume that cluster zero is uh, a lymphocyte, uh, maybe a T cell, so on and so forth. Um, and often we complement manual curate, even, even though we might choose to do automatic uh, cluster uh, annotation, we might complement with manual curation as, as you get deeper, deeper into a cell type differentiation, uh, the class, cell type classification become more and more challenges, even for uh, sophisticated methods. All right, so let's have a look here to automatic cell type classification. There are many algorithms available here. We are just uh, using one, which is singular. Again, we are, we are using it externally on our object. Um, so this, uh, if you execute this code, uh, it will give you error. Uh, one uh, reason why we, we didn't integrate this code into the um, workshop is that was quite complicated uh, considering that the workshop is really long, uh, some dependencies gets really problematic. But usually you would not load all these libraries for bulk and single cell R um, RNA sequencing analysis together. 
Uh, so we just prepare a, a declassification for you. But I can describe here the code. Here we are just uh, fishing the cons from the, uh, our object, our Surat object internally, uh, which is a matrix optimized for sparsity. Uh, we are taking the log as Singular uh, accepts um, log transform data. And we are just loading a reference, uh, a transcript, uh, transcriptomic reference of few cell types, uh, similarly to what LN22 was before. Okay, but this, this is one of the references that is commonly used uh, for single cell analysis. Uh, we, we want to base our classification on the entire clusters uh, in, instead of single cell. This might confer a bit more robustness on our inference. Um, and that's it. This is as simple as it gets. And uh, these three lines, we are just uh, formatting the results we get in a data frame and uh, we are producing cell type data frame. I can show it to you. We have um, compiled it before. By the way, if you want to execute this, we can de you can definitely do it. Uh, you just need to load a single um, R library uh, and uh, hopefully it won't clash with any other library you have loaded so far. So I show you, actually, sorry, I'll show you directly in here. It's my simpler. Okay, pretty simple, a data frame with two columns, our clusters, and the label that Singular uh, attributed. We have apparently some natural killer cells, uh, some monocytes, B cells, and also platelets. We usually would like to exclude platelets uh, experimentally uh, before sequencing. Uh, in this case, we have some. Uh, so, um, yeah, so it's, uh, now that we have this data frame, it's pretty easy to include this information to our, um, to our data, and we use simply a left join, as if uh, we would do with two table. As, as you can see, uh, this uh, new column has been added uh, to, our, to our data structure. Uh, we, we are free to produce visualizations with ggplot to uh, produce summary statistics, so on and so forth. Okay, um, again, here as an example, we can produce summary statistics by using um, tidyverse functionalities. We are again counting how many cells there are in our clusters, and in this case, visualizing uh, the cluster identities as well. Most of cells appear to be NK cells. Uh, again, uh, this is usually not expected. NK cells are usually rare, rarer than most cell types, especially monocytes. Um, but again, this is a, is a subset of the actual original data set. Okay, so before uh, the last section, that is quite a bit more higher level than this. Um, would you like to ask some question? You can, we can have a quick break to, if you want to digest this, have a look to the code or ask me some question. Stefano, there was a question about whether the, um, what was it, cell is the barcode for the single cell. I said, I think it is. Yes, yeah. the, the, the answer in this case, yes. However, uh, if you download data sets from public resources, it's not always the case. So the point that is a cell type identifier which can, in this case, be the actual nucleotide barcode, unique barcode of the, um, in this case, it, it might be a UMI, so unique uh, molecule identifier, identifier used in um, 10X technology for uh, single cell library preparation, uh, but yes, so the answer is yes.
All right, so let's get going. Now we get to the final part of our workshop. Uh, this part, it might be more appreciated by the people that have more experience with Tidyverse. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it's important also to show more advanced uh, functionality of this, of this that you know, interfacing with Tidyverse allows, and in particular, Tidy Surat in this case. So what is nesting? Um, Sometimes we might want to perform analysis on subsets of our data sets. Um, for example, an iterative way to do it is to select, uh, filter our data based on some feature, let's say a cell type identity, create different data sets, and use a for loop to loop uh, across them and to apply some transformation to do some analysis. Okay, nesting allows, is a, is a tidy R uh, functionality, is a, allows to nest data frame inside, uh, inside other data frames, as I will show you. And the point is that in combination with the map function from pool, uh, we are able to do functional programming on the, subs, the, the data subsets in an isolated fashion. So we will iterate for, for um, each of those uh, rows that will include themselves a, a full uh, data frame, and we can apply a, a certain code with those. I will, I will show you the actual data set if uh, this uh, seems a bit convoluted. Okay. Um, okay, what's the rationale here? Uh, in actual analysis, uh, often, we want to identify first what are the lymphoid cells and myeloid cells. These are two cell types, immune cell types that are includes a lot of cell type, but are pretty different from each other. Okay, so since we, we can have thousands of cells, we might want to repeat the analysis in an isolation between these uh, pretty big uh, cell type categories in a way to gain more resolution and more control on our data. Rather than uh, inferring variable genes overall, we want to infer variable genes within lymphoid, within myeloid cells. But there might be many other reasons why you would like to subset your data to, to repeat the analysis. Again, I will show you first of all, what is our data set to start with. Uh, here we are visualizing cell-wise information. Um, and we have our uh, cluster identities, NK cells, uh, and so on, our uh, principal components, so on and so forth. Now, let, well, let's suppose we want to do what I mentioned. We want to, class, we want to label cells as myeloid and lymphoid. In this case, we eliminate the platelets. They are, they are uh, none of them. We are not interested in them in this case. And we use mutate to add a new column, uh, if uh, the cell type identity is macrophages or monocytes, they are myeloid. Otherwise, in this case, they are lymphoid. Lymphoid cells include T cells, natural killers, B cells, so on and so forth. Okay, so let's uh, apply this mutate here. You can imagine what's the result. Uh, we have a new column uh, with uh, the cell class we, we want, lymphoid or myeloid. Now, let's use IDR nest functionalities um, to nest our data set. Okay, now we have a new uh, nested data frame with the cell class we wanted to subset our data according to, and a new column data which include itself data frames. Um, which are themselves Surat objects. So if you have worked with Surat before, uh, this might seem quite magic. It's, it's really convenient to create and subset Surat object without any effort. Uh, so if you did analysis of single cell before, you might appreciate this more. 
uh, that if you've seen for the first time, which uh, is seen quite obvious. So with, with uh, tables, with data frame, this is uh, quite natural, while it's not for complex object, objects like Surat. So we are uh, creating a level of abs abstractions to um, avoid for the user to think about complex data manipulation, to uh, execute what could be in theory quite intuitive uh, operations here. Yeah. Okay, so let's actually produce this data. Uh, so each, uh, again, to just, um, just stress here, each of these data frame will include just the cells that are of these classes, lymphoid or myeloid. Okay, so um, we can mutate the data column itself, just um, replacing with the same data um, uh, content with more information. We can perform some analysis. And you can see here that we can use the map function from uh, pool. It's quite powerful. If you haven't uh, applied this approach to your, uh, to your workflows, I really would strongly suggest to do. It replaces any need to do uh, for loops and so on. Uh, and we can see here that uh, we are taking the subset of data and applying um, find variable genes, reduced dimension, clustering in isolation, isolation within each, each data set. Simply copy and pasting the pipeline we have used before here. So we've really just added a few lines of code. Um, we can execute uh, this code. Okay, what we have back, the same data structure as before, except this um, uh, data frame here will include uh, the, the other columns according to what, uh, what, uh, what analysis we have performed. And just to show you here, um, you know, we can pull um, as we would do the data. to completion it's a bit annoying um, and uh, we see that the content of the data we see two rows and we see again uh, the clusters information and the new PCA uh, this time calculated uh, in isolation um, within for each uh, cell class Okay, so this was really the last section of our workshop. We hope uh, you enjoyed. I will just summarize the key points here. Some bas basic step of single cell RNA sequencing are again, dimensionality reduction, cluster identification, cell type identification, so on and so forth. Tidy Surat is, uh, creates a sort of invisible layer on the Surat object adding, not adding any, um, you know, memory overload. It just creates a, in a layer of abstraction where the user can interact to it as interacting to, uh, with a table. Tidy Surat object is a Surat object in the backend. So any algorithm, for any algorithm, we've, it would lo look like a Surat object. But for us and for Tidyverse, it, it will look like a table. And it's obviously compatible for this reason with any uh, Surat compatible methods. Now, a question it can arise is that um, on, on our data frame, we are selecting, uh, we are visualizing this, uh, the cell wise information. So where the transcript wise information is. Uh, obviously, we cannot produce in this case a full table because the number of rows uh, would become huge. We can easily uh, reach the hundreds of millions because we, have, we can have thousands of cells, thousands of transcripts for tens of hun or hundreds in some case of samples. Okay, but if you want, uh, I think we have in the documentation, but for sure in the uh, Tidy Surat Redmi, if you want to extract a transcript information for variable transcripts, for selected transcripts, it's quite easy using uh, extract abundance uh, function. Okay, so uh, maybe I will uh, leave to uh, Maria the closing remarks if you want to um, 
add something here and uh, I can anticipate we'll open for questions uh, and comments. Yes, th thanks Stefano for that. Um, there's at least one question in the chat at the moment. Um, but yeah, that's the end of the demo part of the workshop. So if anybody, the net remaining part is going to be now questions and answers. So feel free to stay or feel free to go. Um, and thanks to everyone who's come along today and attended at the workshop. Actually, uh, before you go, I can make a, a it's a quick thing. So if you, these, or these methods uh, that we are doing are on um, development, some of them are um, quite polished already, but are increasing in functionalities. If you like those uh, and you appreciate the work would be really helpful. Um, I can post the GitHub here. If you went on the GitHub um, website, and if you like the methods, uh, really give a star to all these methods. Uh, this would help uh, the, the um, exposure of these methods and will greatly help for sure uh, the, the proposal for publication as we are doing currently. So uh, that would be really appreciated. We put a lot of energy and passion in this. Um, so this is my GitHub. All the methods are there and, and much more. So if you take a few minutes, if you enjoy, appreciate, say thanks, uh, putting a star on the several repositories that, that we show you today. That was it. And before everyone go, I really also want to say a few words. Uh, first, thank you everybody who joined. Uh, we had a steady participation throughout the three hours. I think this is great. So thank you all for sticking around. And a big thank you to obviously our wonderful instructors. Uh, I really enjoyed the workshop. It was really, really great. So thank you for also staying late. It's, it's nighttime there in Australia. So thank you for, for that. But also thank you for such an informative content. Uh, I learned so much. I'm working in a drug discovery just once my hands, you know, being I uh, start putting, uh, being put on a project on uh, RNA seq or single cell sequencing to start using this uh, tidy and wonderful uh, workflow that you uh, showed us today. So thank you for that. And also thank you, Phil. Uh, we have Phil Boucher from our studio sticking around with us through the whole workshop and helping us. So thank you, Phil, for staying, uh, staying around as well. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, just, just the last note uh, about a video recording. So we put it in a chat, but maybe people missed it. We do have a dedicated uh, YouTube channel for our and pharma conference uh, that we will be using to upload uh, video recordings of the workshop. So just keep an eye on that. Uh, on that URL, on that page, and click that subscribe button, like my eight-year-old daughter would say, and join our channel. Uh, <laughs> with that, uh, Phil, uh, I don't know if you want to say a few words. Yeah, I mean, I've got just a few things that I'll add. So um, all of you have been added to uh, the R and Pharma our studio cloud organization and the nice thing about that is as you know with the, uh, these use cases especially in, in, in what we looked at today is they need a lot of power um, so that space gives you the maximum amount of resources from our studio uh, cloud so we plan on keeping this up and and, and definitely we're not going to take it down um, so if you want to continue to use that and play with these examples it's a, a nice place to do that and you don't have to install the packages and that kind of thing um, the one trick that I'll show you, uh, Stefano, maybe if you want to show them real quick over in our CU cloud, is if he makes changes to the classroom, sometimes I'll do that after my workshops. Um, if you go over to the Git tab um, on the right hand side, um, as, as you a participant, um, if you just scroll that, that tab over a little bit, yeah, you'll see a Git tab. Just pull that puppy to the left uh, right there. Oh, yeah, you want it. Oh, no, right next to environment. Um, Oh, just go down just a little bit right to environment. There's a, a basically a pain right, that you right to environment. Uh, are oh, you happy? You, you were there, you were there just where it says environment and history. See that puppy right there? Oh, just down just a little bit. You're so close. <laughs> right <there. laughs> Sorry, You're it's, almost it's 2 a.m. I was just uh, Yeah, right there, right there. Don't move. So grab that, that pain and pull it to the left. Yep, yep, right okay. there. Yeah, you should be able to click on that. Yeah, pull it over. Oh, so yeah. Cool. Ah, okay, the guitar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the bills, yeah. Okay. I, I use it extensively. It's now late. Yeah, the Git tab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if if Stefano or um, you know if your colleague makes a change to the to the GitHub repo for the classroom, 
all of all the attendees, all you have to do is if you come back here in a week or two from now, uh, just click that uh, pull request right there, the little the uh, blue down arrow, and that will bring in the changes that they're if they make any. I, I don't know if you will or not. Just giving you a quick hint on that. Um, and then the other thing I'll mention too um, is that we'll send out a, a poll afterwards uh, for the attendees. So. Um, and look, maybe keep an eye out for an email, give us some feedback or, or topics or things for next year would be good. Um, and then other than that, I think, um, I think that's about it. So thank you again for the, for the wonderful help here today and fantastic workshop. And, uh, yeah, hope, and if, uh, we have another workshop coming up today, but if you've signed up for some more and you have any questions, just let us know in the, uh, R and Pharma 2020, uh, Slack group. So. Oh, and it looks like a question maybe just came in to Stefano uh, from Peter here. Yes, uh, the special, well, um, yes. So I, I know, I mean, in this specific case, uh, I know Surat has improved his object to include special information. We have, um, I, I've done some special uh, analysis, but not with Surat. So we have not, we have not done anything with special. So it might work, it might not. It depends if there are big difference in there. So I would say the answer is no at the moment, but definitely is a nice um, area to, to expand the compatibility, definitely. Somebody asked about some uh, cert certificate for participation. Um, we don't have any like, formal adult training certificate. I can't remember the name of that company or organization where you, where you can, um, but I'm sure we can send you an email or something uh, saying that you participated in that. So if, if that's something you need or, or would help, uh, just shoot an email to info at rnpharma.com and then we can, uh, we can send you something saying you participated in the workshop. Good, all right. Uh, Thanks to everybody. It was really good. All right. Yeah, thanks, everyone. So someone's just asking for an email in the chat. Can you put the email about the certificate who they can contact? Uh, yeah, just add it. It's just the, uh, oh, I think it went to the private person. Let me uh, send it to everybody um, right there. So that's just our general uh, inbox that we use for the conference so you you can reach out to us there and we can uh, we can send you back i'll put something together in gimp for you <laughs> for, for you <laughs> something fancy all right well thank you all and uh don't forget we'll see you all next week at our uh, conference three days uh yeah. so stay tuned. <laughs> thank you everybody thanks everyone thanks we'll everyone you. thanks Bill and bye, -bye. bye. Thank you. Bye.